Hello, I'm J.W. Simmons. We would like to invite you to join us today as we talk to a successful businessman, statesman, United States Senator, father, grandfather, Duncan McLaughlin Faircloth, known to his many friends as Locke. This conversation chronicles his journey from growing up in the heart of Eastern North Carolina farm country to Washington, D.C. as a United States Senator. And now, the Honorable Locke Faircloth. Senator Faircloth, want to thank you for allowing us to come into your beautiful home, talk to you about your life, your history, and the part you have played in history. Uh, Duncan McLaughlin Locke Faircloth, uh, you've been United States Senator. I'm going to kind of go backwards here. United States Senator, you've headed up commerce in North Carolina. You've headed up the roads and transportation in North Carolina. You have been involved in the political structure. You started out very young in your life as a young man in business and industry. Uh, most folks look at your name when they see your name, and they see a dynamic leader with someone that has really made a huge impact in the United States, not just North Carolina. So what I want to do, if with your permission, is start out back in the, as early as you can remember, you were born in 1928, but when after you were born in the, in the rural area of Sampson County, uh, your father was involved in agriculture, as I recall from my research, uh, as much as 2,500 acres yeah. way back when you were a very young man, even a boy. Tell us kind of how what you saw from that period of time in, in your life as a young man growing up. And uh, you might want to get into your brothers because you had, your brothers was involved in just about every military service there was. But just I'm just going to let you talk to us about what you saw from your eyes. I want to see what fertilizer fed the dynamic of a, of a gentleman that you are now. I grew up in the depth of the Depression. I was born in 28, and uh, so Roosevelt wasn't elected until 33 and started some programs that began to rejuvenate the economy a little bit. But all through the 30s, this part of the country and the country as a whole was very, very depressed economy. The first real boost of money that I remember when money began to come into the county and the average man got a little bit was in 1940, I think it was late 40s, the 40s, the government decided to build Fort Bragg. Now, Fort Bragg had been there as an old, old army base, but I mean, to, it was just a minuscule, small operation, mm -hmm. maybe 10 buildings, the whole Fort Bragg. And they started hiring people to build Fort Bragg. And they paid the unheard of amount of money. Most people had been working for a dollar a day at the best. They were paying carpenters 90 cents an hour. Of course, everybody in Sampson County got a hammer and became a carpenter. <laughs> and uh, so they, hundreds, thousands of people went to Fort Bragg to and they built into wooden barracks. And uh, a year of that went on, and all of a sudden they, the government decided to build a big marine base. Mm -hmm. And they did at Camp Lejeune. A world of people went down there. So Sampson County and eastern North Carolina as a whole jumped out of the Depression with the military bases that were built. Seymour Johnson was built in Goldsboro, and uh, they built a lot of them. And it, it was the spur that brought this part of the country out of the depression of Hoover's administration. The, the military bases and the federal assets, how did it compare to the agricultural movement in the area, which was stronger as far as an economic boost? 
Well, the agricultural economy was boosted by the Agricultural Adjustment Act when they put in all of these uh, programs, and they helped. They were a big help. But you got to realize that they were, the agricultural economy was still, when they could make 90 cents an hour at the military bases, they went. 90 cents an hour in the 30s and 40s was huge. That was was a huge huge amount of money. uh, Sampson County in Clinton had a big advantage over the rest of eastern, over most of eastern North Carolina because we were big into the produce business, and it provided some early income from May until the produce went on into, you know, different crops, but into October. So that provided a a lot of uh, income, agricultural income for the county. Sampson County was not a tobacco county. It became so with the allotment and went on, but historically, Sampson was not a tobacco county. It was uh, produce and cotton. Now, your family, your daddy, and your family as a whole were heavily into cotton at one time. You had well, they planted cotton, but uh, yeah. But they planted cotton because they wanted anything else to plant. But they were, my, my father got into the produce business, you know, I'd say fairly heavy in the 30s. A man from a little town from Cornell University named Robeson, Harold Robeson who was head of plant pathology at Cornell, Mm -hmm. developed sweet corn. Now, prior to the early 30s, there was no such thing as a table sweet corn. Mm -hmm. You could eat just regular horse corn if you, you know, got it in the roasting year stage but uh, it was, you had, it wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. But this man developed a hybrid sweet corn. And he, this being a big produce area, we grew a lot of corn that was horse corn. What called trucker's favorite it was not a sweet corn at all. But, uh, we shipped it and people ate it. It was, but it, it was not a designed for human consumption corn. So that man came down to Sampson County, Mr. Robeson, because uh, that's, uh, we had a reputation for shipping corn. Mr. Robeson came down with his seed. Mm-hmm the first sweet corn ever been heard of. He developed it. And he got up with the Caldwells and my father, and we started growing sweet corn for a penny an ear the first year. They paid him a penny an ear. And, but it, it was pretty prolific. It made two or three years to the stalk. And uh, they packed it here in Clinton. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people started growing it. And so Clinton was shipping corn everywhere. So sweet corn became the major crop at that time because it was new. It was, uh, it was a sweeter type kernel. How many acres did, did you and your family have? Oh, well, we might have had 100 acres of it, mm-hmm. but a lot of other people had it. It, it. it was brand new. It was a hybrid corn, and with little variation. It's exactly the yellow corn you buy at the grocery store today. 
the the family farm or, or where you grew up is in a community between here and Roseboro called Concord, correct? Yeah. Now, and I remember you mentioning to me, uh, you know, off air some time ago, you mentioned that there was a house there. Uh, the original home place burned down. And, and correct me now, but there was a house your father yeah. built. T- tell us about that house. The house I was born in burned when I was uh, three years old, which would have been about, I was born 28, so about 31. And he built this house on the same plot where the other one burned uh i guess maybe 33 i'm not sure but it was uh i I remember him telling me it was a pretty big old house about 10 12 rooms Mm -hmm. and the man did the labor on it for four hundred and eighty dollars. For the entire house. Yeah, but now of course you didn't have plumbing. You didn't have uh well you had fireplaces, but you had no heat, no plumbing, no it was straight up supple built house. But it's a solid structure because as I understand that house still stands, doesn't oh, it? Yeah, it, it, it was a solid, well built house. But it had no heat, no water, no no anything that we think of today. No bathroom, no it was just wood. Now when you lived in that house, you were living in that house at that time. Uh, with you, your mother, and your father, who was suffering from the strokes. So so you had taken on that responsibility because your brothers were off in the war. Well, they were all in the war, and then by the time they got back, they didn't want to be farmers. They had all had been to Chapel Hill to school, and I believe the two of them had all got to, had graduated, and they had no interest in farming, and so I kind of wound up as the farmer. Well, as, as kind of time goes by here, you, you not only got involved in agriculture, but you got involved in it to the point that there was products that was being shipped and you were interactive up and down the entire coast uh, from Florida to Mockalee, Florida. Does that name ring a bell? Yeah. And, and all the way up, uh, all the way up north. Tell us how that went and how did you, because nowadays folks don't understand, I think, that even way back during the 30s and 40s, products were being shipped uh, in different parts of the country. Well, of course, produce was uh, it's a year-round business. It, it, uh, and a man named Frank Studstall came up here working in produce and uh, he suggested maybe if we had a, if had a little money we could buy st- some different cucumbers and pepper what we're dealing in in Florida in the winter time and ship it mm-hmm. so he did and we had a lot of luck and then you even went up as far as uh, uh, Riverhead, Long Island. Well, then the, we, that sounds like New York to me. Well, it is. <laughs> but he uh, Studstill did, and I we were partners. Uh, but we were we were shipping produce from South Florida up into Long Island. And, and that was an opportunity to not only to take advantage of that, but it was very labor-intensive, was it not? I mean, that was that really something you enjoyed doing, or did you find it burdensome? Well, I, I enjoyed it because we were making some money. But uh, Studstill was more the hands-on partner mm-hmm. in the... Uh, shipping and the packing of the produce. But, of course, we were in Clinton for six weeks or whatever during the season here, and then it, then we'd go into eastern shores of Virginia, Kip Topeka, Nancock, Only, Tasley, Salisbury, Maryland, 
and then up into Long Island. There was there was a time as you progressed through uh, that process. Uh, you, apparently, there was some movement that you ended up getting involved with purchasing some tractors and heavy equipment at some point in your uh, journey here. Tell us about that and how that came about. The fields that you could cultivate and farm very economically with mules didn't work for tractors. Mm -hmm. So there was a big demand for bulldozer work to clear up fields, make them bigger and square them, square them up for for agriculture with a tractor as opposed to with a mule. There was a point in your life that there was a transition for you to some degree on the business end. You, you got involved in, obviously you were heavily involved in agriculture, uh, but there was this transition. You mentioned the the, the crawlers or the caterpillars or, yeah. or the bulldozers is what I refer to them. Those were very important in your future move as it related to concrete and all those kinds of things well, and paving. I, Tell us about that. A man came to town to build car school. He was telling me about a little supple rack of bins. If I would buy, he would buy the concrete to build a school. I bought the, the bins. There was nothing, just a little straight-up set of bins and one little tiny mixer. And I bought that, and he built the school. So after the school was built, I decided I would go into the ready-mix concrete business with two very, very small nothing trucks. So we started it, and it grew. And it, and it grew tremendously fast. Uh, well, was timing important in that because there was other things being built at that time? Oh, there was a lot of things being built. I remember, uh, in fact, the, the man came to me while we were building the school, while the contractor was building the school. We were and to build the armory in Clinton. And he was gonna need concrete. So all of a sudden I, I bought some better equipment and bigger trucks and we got into the concrete business. Now, there was another interesting twist that, that happened along during that time in the early 50s. You got into the car dealership business. You were you were a car dealer in Clinton, and uh, and tell us about that because you not only ended up with one, but you ended up with a number of well, car Well, uh, I got into the car dealership business. I didn't plan to and hadn't planned to. And uh, man, Mr. Ennis Bass, well, did you go back farther? The Oldsmobile Cadillac dealership here was called S and B Strickland and Bass, yeah. and Mister Strickland was killed in an automobile accident about nineteen fifty two or one or two, and Mr. Bass ran it for a while, but he didn't like the automobile business, so he offered to sell it to me. So I bought the automobile business from Mr. Bass, and it was sitting up in the forks of the road, and we called it Triangle. The building is still there, and there's a man running a shop at it today. Another thing that's also fascinating to me is at the same time a lot of these things were happening and, and maybe preceding that, you can kind of give us a timeline on it, you, you became, uh, the opportunity came for you to buy some real estate. So you started buying real estate. I, I bought right much real estate. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time but it was very, very cheap. 
It was very, very cheap. I, I didn't, of course, none of us realized it at the time, but a lot of land was very, very cheap. We, uh, it is strange in the county, early on, I mean, I'll go back into the early 50s, farmland north of Clinton. If a piece of land came up for sale up in there, it was very expensive. We thought it was probably three, four hundred dollars an acre. In the lower end of the county, back towards Garland, and it was generally less desirable, but it would not bring a third as much. There just wasn't the push to buy it in the lower end of the county. Land was much, much cheaper than it was up in the Newton Grove in the northern end of the county. So I didn't buy it in the northern end of the county, to say the least, and I started buying land in the lower end of the county. And, and you bought property, as you said, at, at the time, of course, when you look back now, very cheap because they, people can't imagine what what you actually were able to leverage on that land. But, but not only did you buy land, you bought land in a very smart way because a lot of it was just timberland. A lot of it was timberland, and I got some bargains in that. And uh, then I cleared a lot of land. With the bulldozers, I we kept the bulldozers after I got into the ready mix concrete. So, I, gosh, I I reckon since I was twenty five, three or four, or five years old, I've had three or four bulldozers. I don't know they've ever been without them. And you get the ready mix concrete business, the purchase of the land, all these things going on, the car dealership business going on. You you brought your brother back in, and My he brother. was superintendent, and he, he took over helping you with the concrete business. Well, my brother Haywood, who was uh, an officer in the Marine Corps in World War II, came got into school work and he was in the school system down in Hope County and uh, I got him to come back and work with the equipment, the bulldozers and that sort of thing. That was was going well apparently and obviously you were amassing a huge amount of private business responsibilities and and one would say wealth but interestingly enough during that 18 20 year range when you were a relatively young man your first encounter with politics came about tell us i thought it was interesting when i was doing a little research on this it was almost one of those situations you uh, were invited to a meeting here in Sampson County by the extension agent, and Carr Scott uh, was going to run for governor. And tell us how many people was there. I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, it was right interesting. Uh, the county agricultural agent was a man named E.J. Morgan. And he called me and wanted to know if I would uh, come to a meeting. Uh, I, he told me what it was be, uh, uh, Secretary of Agriculture. Carr Scott was the state agriculture commissioner before he ran for governor. And so I told Mr. Morgan I'd go. So I got there that night and it was about the raggedest six people you ever saw in your life. Nobody was there, just nobody. And uh, a man named Charlie Johnson, who originally was from Burgall, but had been the state treasurer 
uh, 20 years or longer. He was a Raleigh big shot, was running for governor. He was the, if the political hierarchy's candidate. He was the pick. He was the pick. Carl Scott had just kind of blustered on to the scene and nobody was for him. The whole political organization in Sampson County was for Johnson. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in fact, several people got on me, including my brother, that that man didn't have a chance, and uh, Charlie Johnson was the man everybody was supporting. So the, uh, well, I told him that was all right. I, I didn't plan to do much, but Scott asked me that night would I be his county manager? Well, now, that was kind of a joke because there was nobody else there. But anyway, I said, all right. He said, all you got to do is name up, nail up a few placards. So I nailed up the placards, and everybody expected uh, Car Scott to lose and lose big. Well, the race came, and there was another man in it named Ole Ray Boyd. I don't know how I remember his name, but threw it into a runoff. So it was getting pretty tight now, and Scott was beginning to catch on a little bit with agriculture. He was beginning to have a lot of appeal to Agricultural communities generally were kind of pushing him. And he won in the runoff. He beat Charlie Johnson. Surprised everybody. Everybody. And uh, the total surprise. I mean, so surprised all the politicians. Interesting thing was when when you were supporting Carr Scott at that time, as I remember reading somewhere, you were really not even old enough to vote at that time. Is that correct? Well, that would have been that would have been true for about a few months. Yeah, I was, but uh, I rode around with him a little bit. I didn't do much of anything. First time I really got involved in politics. I mean, with any any, any enthusiasm was was Mel Broughton was elected to the Senate and he uh, died almost immediately. He, he he was in Washington, I don't know, a very short time and had a heart attack and died. So Carr Scott being the governor had to appoint a replacement for Mel Broughton. I remember as if it were yesterday, but I... I it had to have been in the 50s, the early 50s. And Carr Scott had asked me to come up to his house at Hall River and go somewhere with him, to drive somewhere with him. It wasn't a big deal, but... And we were going to be overnight, so I went up and... Not many people remember, would ever know this, and he. But I got there, and Miss Scott was fixing lunch. Broughton, Senator Broughton, had died, and you know he knew that Scott had to appoint a replacement. And I think I was as surprised as he was. He was kind of talking about different people during break, uh, lunch that he might appoint prominent people to go to the Senate. I wasn't having much to say. And Ms. Scott turned around from serving the food and said, well, I'll tell you who ought to be appointed the senator. Dr. Frank Porter Graham. 
I didn't say anything. And Scott said, Governor Scott said, well, you know, he's never been involved in politics. She said, that's the reason. So Governor Scott didn't appoint Frank Porter Graham to the Senate. Ms. Scott did that morning at breakfast. She made that decision. That, that decision was made. Well, now, Dr. Dr. Graham was not really a conservative thinker, was he? Was he more of a what, – what would you? how would you analyze him as his thought process? A very sophisticated educator – but a little short on practical knowledge. Brilliant man, but somehow he was not very uh, comfortable with uh, just working people. He was a wonderful man, brilliant man, and all of those things. But around most people, he appeared a little overeducated. And so, sometimes that you run into folks that, that are not able to do that. Now, that's been one of your big pluses, I think, is that you're able to connect with whoever's around you. Well, nobody ever accused me of being overeducated. <laughs> he appointed Dr. Graham to the Senate. He had to run again. You know, Dr. Graham, the appointment was a temporary right. appointment. And Car Scott called me. And I was trying to farm and do everything I could think of to make a living. And he called me to come up to Raleigh. I was a young man, and so I went, of course. And needless to say, I was there. You were in your 20s? Yeah, early yeah, 20s. 20s. And he says, who you supporting for governor? I mean, for the Senate. Well, of course, I knew he'd appointed Dr. Graham, and I wasn't about to say anything else. Oh, I said, I'm for Dr. Graham, 100%. He said, well, I'm glad to hear that. I want you to drive him some. He needs somebody that knows the state and kind of knows farming and farm people to drive with him, and I want you to drive him some. I said, well, good, good. I'll, where do you want me to take him? He says, I want you to stay with him from now till the election. I says, Governor, that's seven months. He says, I know, but I want you to stay with him. So I traveled, I don't mean weekends and you know yeah. but I pretty much stayed with Dr. Graham for seven months until the election he lost when I as politics progressed was that a real transition moment for you to see politics up front and meet people and connect all over the state did that well, did that driving opportunity it, uh, it was but uh I never looked on politics as anything but an avocation. You had a, uh, you got married, and I, I want you to kind of, if you will, talk about that a bit. Uh, you've you've had a wonderful family life. You got a wonderful daughter uh, uh, right here in Clinton, and uh, it, it adds to the quality of life. I just want to open that door and let you talk about that and that experience. Well, I was. Married very early, very briefly, and uh, it did not work out. Oh, I was single, I can't even count, 15 or 18 years, a long time. And Nancy and I, Nancy Bryan and I met, and uh, we were both in our high 30s, she was maybe 35, I was 39 or something, and we got married. Now, you and Nancy were uh, married for how long? How many years? Oh, close to 20. 20 years. And now, where was Nancy from? Where was her? She was from Greensboro. What What was uh, the setting that that you and Nancy met? How did, how did you come together? How did you come to know her? A good friend of her family a long time 
Greensboro friend was uh, the Pryor family who were Vicks Vapor Rub. They was their business. And a man named Richardson Pryor. That's politics. Uh, yeah. Nancy grew up knowing him in Greensboro. You know, they were, they knew each other as young people and grew up. But he was running for governor. Richard Pryor running for governor. And uh, Terry Sanford came to me and said, I need you to manage his campaign. I told him uh, that was a big undertaking. Uh, he, he said, we'll get a front man if you help him. So anyway, I agreed to work at Richardson Pryor's campaign for governor. Well, it so happened Nancy was working in New York and had been. She was with uh, Fortune Magazine, had a very, very nice job with Fortune Magazine. And, but as I said, the had grown up with the priors. They were just all right, same streets. And so she took a leave of absence, I'm sure he asked her to, from Fortune to come down and work in his campaign. So that's where I met Nancy. So how hard was it to get somebody with that kind of background from Greensboro, employee working with Fortune Magazine in New York, now she finds herself in Clinton, North Carolina, Clinton, Clinton, whatever, but it's a small town. Th that's a, an unbelievable, got to be a shift in geography, mindset, people. D did she adjust well to that environment? Well, <laughs> yes, I, I think pretty well. I, I mean, it, it, yes, I I think she probably adjusted well, better to the environment than she did to me. Uh, yes, I, I, Nancy had a lot of friends in Clinton, and I, I, I think was well-liked by a lot of people. That's uh, my opinion. I think she was. Uh, I, people still come up to me and mention her favorably. So I think she got along real well in Clinton. And now, Anne was was born along what period of time in your marriage? I think we got married in 67. Mm -hmm. And I think Anne was born 69. You know, and a lot of folks know, know Anne and, and, and know her to be part of the community yeah. in Clinton. And she's very well thought yeah. of. Yeah. Uh, and I know I've, I've got to ask this question because uh, our audience is probably going to wonder why I didn't if I don't. When you look at Anne and when you're around Anne, do you see a lot of your traits or do you see a lot of Nancy's traits? Anne, unfortunately, wound up with kind of my round face and appearance, but I keep telling her she'll grow out of it. Uh, I think Anne got the best traits of each of us. I think she very much did. I think she got, if either, if the two of us had any good traits and characteristics, I think Anne inherited the good. What, what going forward from this point, and, and I'm going to kind of set the stage for maybe a future discussion here, as, as you look at the business side of your life, the, the social, the marital side of your life, the dynamic of the political side of your life, it's been from someone outside looking in, it just seems to be a huge, huge amount of activity going on. How are you able to keep all that balanced? Well, I'm not sure I did. Uh, 
I probably had too much going on. But we just had a lot of good people that have worked with us and over the time. Not to in any way be, be flippant or careless in saying this. I have always adhered very closely. If you bring in a person to do a job until they clearly and clearly demonstrate they can't do it or won't do it, leave them alone. Well, Senator, I want to I want to thank you for for taking the time and sitting and talking with us and 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 discussing the life and times of Senator Lot Faircloth. Uh, certainly, you know, I want to again uh, tell you that we'd love to come back and finish this discussion because, to be uh, perfectly frank with you, I think I could talk for weeks about some of the things and adventures you've been involved in. So, with that said, uh, we'll kind of bring closure to this segment, and uh, we'll look forward to coming back to this uh, lovely home that you live in here. And maybe in that segment, we can get into this home and kind of look at the grounds a bit. So uh, we'll look forward to next time and uh, inviting all of our audience to come back and, and our conversation with Senator Lot Faircloth. Thank you, and you're welcome to be back. Thank you for being with us for part one. We encourage you to be with us for part two as we talk to Locke about his early days in politics and his journey to the United States Senate.